um, when our reading series begins. And I should say that of our reading series, Mine and Jean's, this is the last, the last one. The last one we'll be hosting in the Enclave series. However, you may be happy to learn that Enclave will reboot around January 15th next year with uh, curated by Charles Alexander and Tenny Nathanson from Tucson, Arizona, and presumably technically hosted by the University of Arizona, I assume, no? Okay, whatever, you'll learn that later, there will be uh, communiques, so keep your eyes out for that. And it will be the same format, I think, right? Are you, yeah, okay. Um, so today, uh, as you've already heard some of you, it are, as, our, as is our custom, the audience will remain muted and the chat function is not available during the reading to reduce stray noise, distraction, and to protect us all from Zoom bombing. Early in our, uh, in our career running this series, we had a, a, like the worst Zoom bombing you could possibly imagine. Um, so we're very careful about that. Um, I usually say now what we have coming up next, but we have nothing coming up next. Today, we have Laylee Long Soldier, who will be introduced by Jean. But before I turn it over to Jean, I want to uh, talk a little bit about her. By now, she needs no introduction. We have such a regular audience that you're always hearing about us. But, you know, there are some new people here. So um, Jean Huving is a professor of interdisciplinary arts at the University of Washington, Bothell. She is a poet and a scholar. Um, she has, she is the author of several critical books. Uh, the two most recent are The Transmutation of Love and Avant-Garde Poetics from the University of Alabama Press and Inciting Poetics, Thinking and Writing Poetry, a collection of essays co-edited with Tyrone Williams from the University of New Mexico Press. She is the author of several collections of poetry and the most recent that's out, I believe, is Mood Indigo, which appeared this year from Selva Oscura um, and which weaves together many threads, including the sea, jazz, uh, textures and fabrics. And um, so she's a, she's a writer of complex textures. So now I turn it over to you, Jean, to introduce Lely. Okay, um, let me make, great, okay. Um, I am very happy to introduce Laylee Long Soldier for our, right in my final enclave reading. She is the author of two books of poetry, Chromo Samori, I may be saying that wrong, and Whereas. She has received multiple awards, including a Lannan Literary Fellowship, a Native Arts and Culture Foundation National Artist Fellowship, and a Whiting Award. Her book, Whereas, was recognized with the National Book Critics Circle Award and Penn Jean Stein Award, as well as it was a finalist for a National Book Award. Uh, in Whereas, Laylee takes up an official document that in the name of an apology to Native Americans deeply insults and diminishes them and then insists on its own remove from any legal repercussions. In her whereas, Long Soldier engages the legal posturing of this document, how it creates whereas, whereas this, whereas that, whereas this, to create her erudition, taking the legal ease from the apology and creating her own whereas statements. Long Soldier writes about this apology in a preface to her title poem in the volume, Whereas. Uh, in December 2009, President Barack Obama signed the Congressional Resolution of Apology to Native Americans. No tribal leader or official representatives were invited to witness and receive the apology on behalf of tribal nations. 
The apology was then folded into a larger, unrelated piece of legislation called the 2010 Defense Appropriation Act. In a double speak, this is me again, in a double speak, speaking out of both sides of its mouth, the apology set out a set of whereas statements describing the conditions of Native Americans, then proceeded to create resolutions and a disclaimer. The disclaimer being that the apology did not establish any basis for legal action or redress. It was simply an apology, however poorly stated, delivered, and hidden within other legislation. Laley brilliantly takes on the possibility that the whereas statements enable turning the tables. As she comments in a recent interview, I'm really not anyone significant as far as the bigger workings of things, I'm just a person. But using that language myself, the language of whereas, then resolution and disclaimer, it helped me establish a sovereignty. I didn't want to jump back 100, 200 years in history. I wanted to say this, the specifics of what it is to be a native person living now. One of her several entries starting with whereas begins, I tire of my effort to match the effort of the statement. Then she proceeds to quote from the apology itself. Whereas native peoples and non-native settlers engaged in numerous armed conflicts in which unfortunately both took innocent lives, including those of women, and children. Laley then continues, I tire of engaging in numerous conflicts, tire of the word both, both as a woman and a child of that whereas. And this particular part of the poem, she continues investigating what it means to be tired and to be real, apart in this instance from the endless euphemisms that would seem to protect women and children, especially Native American women and children and Native men from the ravages they know only too well. Throughout Whereas Long Soldier addresses her double citizenship as an American citizen and as an Oklahoma Lakota, constituting a poetics of an inquiry into language itself. While at once committed to tell of the injustice and displacement she and other Native peoples have suffered, as a poet, she never takes language itself for granted. As she writes, everything is in the language we use. While this involves her at times in a study of the Lakota language, finding a different way of being in and through this language, it also makes her wary of assertion itself. In whereas, Long Soldier's hesitations and negations are its ethical gold standard. She writes, whereas resolutions an act of analyzing and restructuring complex ideas into simpler ones, so I place a black bracket on either side of an idea, I coordinate to safety away from national resolution, the threat of reductive thinking. So here, is lately. Thank you for all of this. <laughs> thank you so much, Jean, and thank you to everyone for even being here on a on a Sunday afternoon <laughs> uh, and taking time to share in poetry and um, yeah, all of this. And I also apologize to 
to all of you and also to Jean and everyone, <laughs> if I'm awkward, uh, this pandemic has made me socially really, I was already socially awkward and I'm even worse now. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm going to do my best. Um, but I am very happy to be here with you. And I also really wish that uh, we could be together in person, but that's okay. We'll do our best. Um, that was a really generous introduction. So thank you for that. Um, I've, I'm gonna share some work today. I think maybe just cause I've been really uh, pondering this thing of uh, history and the present and the, the ways in which they are not separate things. We are here today because of, of where we've come from, right? Uh, even we would say even here in this country, we are at this moment because of a very long history of foundation that was laid, right? And so <clears throat> some, even some of the troubles, the turmoil that we've been facing is a result of, of some of that. So uh, we are never really separate from history, but I also think I've been thinking a lot about that, maybe even in terms of family, uh, family history, generational things that we carry. And um, always, I think maybe our desire to have a, a happy, uh, a wonderful present for, for where we're at now, we always want it to be the best but there's always continual work that we have to do uh, in ourselves, uh, what we carry with us as you know, in our families and so on. And never mind um, the outside world, what, what we have to deal with, let's say culturally or with, with politics and so on. Um, so I've been thinking about some of that stuff, thinking about um, family, generational things. Um, my daughter, I guess recently, you know, I've had some talks with my daughter. I have a 14 year old daughter. And even at this age, she's been through her own, uh, you know, her own difficulties, struggles. And I am encouraging her to maybe begin to feel like it's okay to be open about those things, to share them because they can help others also. You know, it puts people at ease sometimes to hear that we we're none of us are perfect and none of our lives are perfect, you know. I'm gonna read a little piece that I wrote about her when she was really small. <laughs> This is titled Edge. This drive along the road, the bend, the banks behind the wheel, I am called Mommy. My name is Mommy. On these drives, the sand and brush, the end of winter we pass. You in the rear view, double buckled, back center, my love. Your mother's mouth has a roof. Your mother's mouth is a church, a hut in a field, lone standing. The thatched roof has caught spark. What flew from walls, the spark apart from rock, from stable meaning. Large car steady at the curve, palest light, driest day, a field of rocks we are not poor, sealed in windows. You hum in the back. I do not know what to say, how far to go, 
the winter near dead. As we drive, you do not understand word for word. The word for you is little. But you hear how it feels always. The music plays, you swing your feet. And I see it. I, mommy, the edge. But do not point, do not say look as we pass the heads, gold and blowing, these dry grasses eaten in fear by man and horses. That was such a great time in life, you know, when uh, driving around when my daughter was small in the, um, car seat buckled up in the back you know if any of you have uh kids it's really cute to listen to music and take a drive and um it's a it's a beautiful age Dilate, placed on my chest, warm, fragile, as the skin of nightfall she was, heavier than imagined. Her eyes, untied from northern poles, from hard, unseen winter months. She arrived safely. Mid-spring, she scrunched her brow and uplook to her father. There's a turning as pupils dilate, as black vernal suns slip into equinox. This was, we never forget her, first act. Two, all is experienced through the body. Somebody told me. Three, though I did not feel it when the midwife invited, when he cut the tie, the clean umbilical sever when I smiled, I did not feel it as they took her to wash and weigh when I said you should go with her. Both of them gone, father and baby, in a supple, empty orange light. I listened from behind a clock on the wall, my own face, heavy plate glass. Though all experience is through the body, I did not feel my hands pull. White sheets, my legs shake when Two nurses cooed, lean back, honey, you are bleeding more than expected. Oh my God, childbirth, it's hell. <laughs> I'm just kidding, not for everyone. I guess just for me, sometimes, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> It was not easy. Okay. I guess today too, you know, I was kind of thinking about the, the thing of, of experience. I had another poet, I had an, another reading recently and this poet was talking to me 
about her hesitation sometimes in writing about uh, certain experiences that are particular to uh, motherhood or, you know, children, those kinds of things. She was hesitant to bring that into her work uh, as a, as a poet, as an artist. And, you know, I, I think that I have never really shied away from that only because it's part of our human experience, right? It's part of what makes us who we are. And there's a particular, after all is said and done, there's a particular kind of, I think, strength maybe, or compassion that comes out of those experiences. So I don't mind sharing it. Let's see here. So as I said, uh, I have really been thinking about the generational kind of stuff uh, that we carry. Uh, you know, certainly as parents, we want things to be uh, roses and rainbows for our families, you know, but um, we're just human. And so we have to work at it, you know. Uh, I'm going to read a piece now from the second section of my book. And I actually, um, I read this piece quite often because um, for me, this it's kind of like the heart of the book um, and it has to do with my father. Um, and so in the second half of the book, I am addressing the national apology um, that, that you talked about, Jean, in the introduction. So the National Apology to Native Americans. And as part of that work, I really spent a lot of time thinking about, about apology and about what makes it feel good, what makes it work, you know? Um, because when a when a real apology happens, when it's sincere and you can feel it, you know it's, it's, it's real, uh, it can change, it can alter things completely. It can completely change a relationship. So I'm sharing this piece um, and this is about an apology. This is uh, from a turning point in my own life an apology from my father that really changed the course of our relationship. And I would say the course of my own life, it was um, tra transformative. Whereas I heard a noise I thought was a sneeze at the breakfast table, pushing eggs around my plate, I wondered if he liked my cooking, thought about what to talk about. He pinched his fingers to the bridge of his nose, squeezed his eyes, he wiped. I often say he was a terrible drinker when I was a child. I'm not afraid to say it because he's different now. Sober, attentive, showered, eating. But in my childhood, when things were different, I rolled onto my side, my hands together as if to pray, locked between my knees. When things were different, I lay there for long hours, my face to the wall blank. My eyes left me, my soldiers, my two scouts to the unseen. And because language is the immaterial, I never could speak about the missing. So perhaps I cried for the invisible what I could not see doubly. 
What is it to wish for the absence of nothing? There at the breakfast table as an adult, wondering what to talk about, if he liked my cooking, pushing the invisible to the plate's edge. I looked up to see he hadn't sneezed. He was crying. I'd never heard him cry, didn't recognize the symptoms. I turned to him when I heard him say, I'm sorry, I wasn't there, sorry for many things. Like that, curative voicing, an opened bundle, or medicine, or birthday wishing, my hand to his shoulder. It's okay, I said, it's over now, I meant it. Because of our faces, blankly, because of a lifelong stare down, because of centuries in sorry. Okay, I am going to, uh, in the same section of the book, addressing the national apology. Since it's, since my daughter is on my mind today, I'm going to end generational uh, uh, sort of the things that we go through generation to generation. All those things are on my mind. I'm going to read a piece that is actually about my daughter again, but in this in this case, it applies to um, uh, the national apology. It was a way of uh, responding to that document. Whereas my eyes land on the shoreline of quote, so this quote is from that congressional document. My eyes land on the shore, shoreline of, quote, the arrival of Europeans in North America opened a new chapter in the history of native peoples, end quote. Because in others, I hate the act of laughing when hurt, injured, or in cases of danger. That bitter hiding. My daughter picks up new habits from friends. She'd been running, tripped, slid on knees and palms onto asphalt. They carried her into the kitchen. She just fell. She's bleeding. Deep red streams down her arms and legs, trails on white tile. I looked at her face. A smile quivered her. A laugh, a nervous. Doing as her friends do, she braved new behavior feigned a grin. I couldn't name it, but I could spot it. Stop, my girl. If you're hurting, cry. Like that, she let it out, a flood from living room to bathroom, then a soft water pour. I washed carefully, light touch, clean cotton to bandage. I faced her, I reminded, in our home, in our family, we are ourselves. Real feelings, be true. Yet, I'm serious. When I say I laugh, reading the phrase, quote, 
opened a new chapter. I can't help my body. I shake. The realization that it took this phrase to show. My daughter's quiver isn't new, but a deep practice, very old. She's watching me. Yay, there's that. <laughs> Yay. Okay. Let's see how we're doing on time. How am I doing on time, Jeannie? Or Jean, I'm sorry. Um, you've been reading for maybe 20 minutes, Max. Mm -hmm. Please read some more if you wish. I will. <laughs> I got some things in store for you. I've actually been sharing some other pieces recently uh, in, in the past few readings. Um, that are actually visual, just to mix things up and um, have some fun. So I thought I would share some visual work. Uh, I have a project from a couple years ago uh, that I'm still working on, if you can believe it. So I'll share some of that. And then I'll share uh, something very recent um, within the last month or two. There you go. Can you guys see that? Yes. Okay, so I'm gonna share some pieces from, because I do work visually and a lot of times when I work visually, I also have um, written work to accompany it. And so um, it's kind of fun to work that way because I end up with both written work that I can use on the page. And then I also have, um, um, the, the visual work. So I'm going to share a, a project that was in a, an exhibit titled Midakuye Oyasin. And if I have any, if there's any uh, native friends here or Lakota friends, uh, you might be already very familiar with this phrase in our language. Um, it means, it roughly translates to like, um, all my relatives, or we are all related, something like that. So it's a phrase that you'll hear a lot, you hear often um, in public settings. A lot of native people use, use that phrase when they're giving a presentation or saying a few words, they'll close with midakuye oyasin. And um, I worked with, excuse me, Sorry about that. Uh, I, I um, collaborated with two other Lakota artists um, to uh, be put on this exhibit where we kind of explored the meaning of that phrase a little deeper um, because what we were finding is that a lot of people have adopted that or um, I want to even say maybe not, not in a bad way, but they've sometimes appropriated that phrase and not really understanding the, the larger context and the philosophy of, of being a relative in Lakota culture. So we wanted to have a, an exhibit to talk to and learn from our community members who speak our language, who, knows, who know a bit more about our philosophy and so on, and um, maybe do some work that sort of um, honored that, uh, honored that knowledge. So what I did was uh, for my project, I, the, what you see right here is a pattern for a star quilt. Have you guys seen star, star quilts? I see some yeses, uh, especially in the Northern Plains um, and a lot of our um, native communities, you will see this everywhere. <laughs> it's become like a whole art form uh, and a lot, especially in Lakota community, 
Um, people give the give star quilts to each other for all kinds of occasions, um, birthdays, graduations, even when they pass away. People pass away. Um, everybody brings the family a star quilt and so on. So what I did was I took this pattern. I don't sew. I do not. It's just horrible. I don't sew. But I had a pattern that one of my cousins gave me. And it was sitting around my house and I didn't know what to do with it. But when this exhibit came up, I decided to take this, pa this pattern and expand these diamonds to one foot long each. So instead of being small for uh, something to sew, I expanded them. And I got, I ordered um, heavy cotton paper from India. And so I worked with paper instead of fabric. And um, I sewed them. It's kind of hard to see maybe in this picture, but I sewed those pieces together with copper wire. Um, let me see here. I'm going to make a bigger view for you. Oh, Shoot, I have to start something. Here's all of my bunch of visual projects. Anyway, so maybe you can see it better here, the copper wire. And what I did was I listened to interviews from our community and I took notes and I wrote some poems and I wrote some poems in these diamonds. And I took, I took it to a laser cutter and the white space you see is a uh, text that um, they laser cut for me. Up here is, uh, I took a photograph of a buffalo hoof in the mud and the laser cutter actually uh, just took that photograph and cut it also into these pieces. So those are hooves. There's a little buffalo. So it's hard to tell, but this is actually measures six feet long. There's six diamonds. And when I put them all together, this is what it ended up looking like. I sewed it. And that measures about 12 feet high by 12 feet wide. And each diamond contains a, um, a poem. And the way the poem is read is you start at this top diamond. And then you can weave the viewer, the reader, the viewer can make their own poem. Depending on which direction they choose to go. So from top to bottom you can make maybe 10 to 12 different pieces, different poems. Um, and this is all on the subject of midakuye uh, uyasin, being, being a relative uh, in Lakota philosophy belief. I have read from, I've read many of these pieces recently. So I'm actually going to share some other pieces that I wrote based on this multicolored star. Um, and this one is not sewn together, nor is it laser cut. I use stencil work and it's in pieces, you can see. So this visual piece was dedicated to the process of making, what it is to make something for a relative, to put the time and energy into it. Um, so you can see down here, I put all the tools I used and so forth. So that was part of the installation. Here's some of the stencil work. The um, piece was titled Mosquitoes because uh, in our belief system, even mosquitoes are considered our relatives. All of creation is our relative, are considered our relatives from the animals, uh, also the plant, we call them plant people. <laughs> All of the natural world, there is a relationship that we have with everything around us, even the stars. So, um, and I just got a kick out of thinking about how mosquitoes are also our relatives. I think all of us know a few mosquitoes. We have a few mosquitoes in our life, right? We can't help it. It cannot be avoided. And they have a right to be here too. So anyway, I was meditating on that. I'm going to share some of those pieces in a second. 
And these are some of the other pieces that were in the exhibit. You can see my friend Mary made a buffalo skull and a stone. She suspended them from the ceiling and people could come in and put their heads inside. And inside each of those pieces was a little screen. And on the screen were interviews from our community members talking about being a relative. So you could put your head in there and learn what it is uh, to be related to the world around you. That There's a porcupine, also one of our relatives, but that's a screen inside the stone, the big stone. My friend Mary uh, sewed sweet grass in there so you could smell the sweet grass and you could hear from, from one of our community members. This is Mary, the one who did the sculptures. This is Clementine, Mary Bordeaux and Clementine Bordeaux. Clementine uh, conducted the interviews. She studied a documentary film. Okay, so I'm not gonna read from the black quilt. I'm gonna read from the multicolored one. And that multicolored one was what you would call a found poem, I suppose. And I worked with a short story written by Zint Kala Shah. So if you're not familiar with Zint Kala Shah, you, you, you could look her up. Um, and she's one of the earliest Dakota writers, published writers, especially Dakota women writers. So the reason I'm sharing her, those found poems from her story is because I consider her a, a literary ancestor. So if we were to talk about generational, uh, you know, growth and change, um, she is someone um, that I consider part of my uh, literary family tree. Isn't she beautiful? Oh, I just love her. Anyway, um, she wrote a, a story called The Widespread Enigma Concerning Blue Star Woman. So you can actually find that story online. What I did was I separated out the parts of speech, verbs, nouns, dialogue, all kinds of things from that story. What I found was that when I stripped away the particulars of that era, of that story, I found that the language Zint Kala Shah was using, excuse me, the language she was using to write about issues of identity, issues of um, conflict and resistance, land, all of those uh, concerns in the native community, we are using very much the same language, almost the very same language today. It hasn't changed. And I, I realized also a lot of maybe the pain, the generational trauma that we carry, it's very old. And it was being written about and discussed, uh, you know, a hundred years ago in the same ways. And so that, that was helpful to me. I grew from that, you know, realizing we have to have patience, patience with each other, patience in our communities um, as we sort of work through some of this stuff. So again, if I have any friends here joining us, especially friends who are native, you may recognize some of the issues that, are, that pop up in these pieces concerning tribal enrollment, concerning identity and belonging, um, which uh, become very complex and have become complex since first contact. So Zint Kala Shah was writing from that place, early contact. Okay. Again, this is taken from the star. You start at the top and you can weave your way down. The reader can make their own poem as they go, but I'm going, I'm going to um, read it for you. Yeah. 
who am I, was no longer the obsessing riddle of her life, the morning taught deep abstraction. I am a being in its center, an answer to who were your parents. Who am I was no longer the per persistent question. Her inquiry prompted deep abstraction. I am a being in its center, an answer to who were your parents? Who am I had become the persistent question, unwritten law held deep abstraction. I am blue star woman, in its center, an answer to who were your parents? Who am I had become proof of membership in the tribe. Unwritten law required deep abstraction. I am blue star woman, be that as it may, the government means who were your parents? Who am I had become proof of membership in the tribe. The white man's law disregarded deep abstraction. A piece of earth is my birthright. Be that as it may, the government means who were your parents. The fact was circumstances of her early childhood were matters of dispute as the sharpened names from her tribe boiled like smoke blackened coffee, fire between her and her heritage. The fact was circumstances of her family tree were unrecorded as the speared names from her tribe boiled like smoke blackened coffee, fire between her and her heritage. The fact was, verbal reports about her family tree were contradictory as the lifted names of her memories boiled like smoke blackened coffee, fire between her and her heritage. The fact was, verbal reports about old, old teachings were contradictory as the added names of her memories boiled like the hot breads sing fire between her and her heritage. The fact was verbal reports about old, old teachings were of far greater importance as the roused names of the dead boiled like the hot Breads sing fire between her and her heritage. Cool. You know, if you want, uh, I'm stopping here because I realize we're almost out of time. But if you want me to, I can share one last little um, project or we can um, call it an afternoon, whatever you feel like. What do you think, Jean? Uh, let's do the last project. That was One last project. Okay, why not? Because you know what? It's a it's a happy project, <laughs> and it's on the note of uh, you know at what I was saying, to, thinking about today with family generations and um, healing, changing, you know, growing and all of that and so it might be a nice note to close hey, on. Amy, I want to say that I have to go because I have a date so I'm going to have to I'm not that, not that kind of date but um <laughs> so I'm going to have to miss this last one but go oh. for it I really loved hearing you and I'm going to sign off sorry Jean but I okay sounds good okay
Thank you. <laughs> and actually this last project shouldn't take too long. Uh, so uh, we, we will conclude in a little bit here, um, but it's a nice note to end on. So I'm gonna try uh, share screen once again. Let's see how this goes. Let's see. Oh. Okay. It's where we left off on. Okay. Ignore that. <laughs> All right. Can you see this, Jean? Yeah. Okay. Great. My last project is uh, it's a little thing I did with my daughter. This was a month or two ago. Um, I was asked to submit some work to a journal. And um, in all honesty, the COVID, uh, the politics, and this year has been really difficult. And I know it has been for a lot of people, right? So I was feeling really heavy and I didn't really know. Uh, I wasn't in the mood to write anything like whereas pieces or <laughs> I, I was just feeling, you know, feeling too much. So I decided I wanted to do something uh, that brought energy and that was enjoyable. And also that included my daughter because she's also, you know, the whole family has sort of um, been coping with the circumstances this year. So I wanted to do something with my daughter and I did a project titled Tumbleweeds. And what we did is um, for years I have loved tumbleweeds and I have always pictured, um, I don't know why, but making hats out of them. So we decided to do that. So we um, got some tumbleweeds and we made hats out of them and we went all around to different locations in Santa Fe and uh, took photographs. So this is in front of uh, a monument that has been torn down. It was torn down um, Columbus Day. Uh, some local ac activists literally threw a rope up on that monument and pulled it down. And this was a monument in Santa Fe celebrating uh, the genocide, the murder of, uh, quote, uh, savage Indians. And it was something that we all have to walk past and see uh, sometimes on a daily or a weekly basis. Uh, and it's a horrible thing, I think, you know, for our children have to, our children to have to see and uh, and so it was exciting that it's been taken down. But this was uh, just before that. We didn't know it was going to come down. So we went and um, stood in front of that monument. We went and we washed a car. We washed our car and uh, wore our tumbleweed hats. We went to a place called uh, Camel Rock. It's a natural site. Um, it's, uh, imp this is a special site for Tesuke Pueblo, uh, one of the Pueblos in our area. So, and I often go there actually just to sit and, uh, have, have some quiet time to myself. So, and I loved the way that the form, the shape was kind of mirrored. We all have that same shape happening. So that was super fun. And, um. I'm gonna close with maybe the field notes that I took for that project. I don't know if you would call this a poem. I don't know what it is, but I'll share some of the things I wrote in um, as we made, did this project together. Uh, field notes, tumbleweed project. Oh, so this was in September. Look at how fast time goes. It's already November, I can't believe it. Okay, here we go. I watched the sun lower its head to kiss the horizon. I did. 
Until then, I hadn't thought so deeply about resilience. I thought about love as well. I often say that I feel most loved when I feel understood. So the differences between us must be seen and felt for you to understand me best. Likewise, for me to understand you, sun plus horizon. I've been heavy. My body hurts, you know. I drag the, stu the stubborn tonnage of history, both personal and shared. Then somebody told me about self-care. It's a big thing now. Did you guys hear about this? <laughs> Did you hear about this thing called self-care? Oh my God. Okay, someone told me about it. <laughs> All right. To self-care, I took a bath with mineral salts and breathed the eucalyptus. Yet I felt better in all honesty when my cell phone dinged with a loving text. I feel bestest when planted in a seat next to you, spilling the beans in our mutual carrying. I realize that I like connection, the real thing. So I took a road trip to see my sister friend. We fed horses and I picked tumbleweeds pinned to a fence. These beautiful tumbling things, innocent, hurtful. I couldn't ignore the calling to cart them home. In this world, some of us are unbelievably strong, wildly resilient, resilient. My friends, my mom, my sisters, cousins, aunties. Yet, I can't say I'm strong because I'm always running to the page to admit it. These times are overwhelming. This year is not a year. It's a sledgehammer. 365 iron thuds, backbreaking. There's so much to do now, so much, I know. Still, I feel most alive, purposeful even, when I encounter or imagine the absurd. Once, a crow swooped down next to me, carrying a bright orange Cheeto in its beak. It felt like a message. So I made a little painting of it for my BFF. It was during the depression stage of COVID. We wore face masks as my BFF opened her B-Day gift. She laughed so hard. We belly laughed together. It was well worth the time I took to paint a crow with a Cheeto. Likewise, for years, whenever I drove through the desert and spotted tumbleweeds, I pictured wearing one on my head. No matter how hard times are, this delights me, the energy. I wish I could, but I cannot promise anything from my existence, except that I like the unexpected. I like surprise electricity. It's funny that I cannot find the unexpected. It swoops down or blows across the road when it wants to. But whenever it arrives, I am eager to share it. I avoid using the pronouns we or us in my writing. I don't want to presume to speak for anyone else. But sometimes I do think about we and us. When Solange, you guys know Solange? Anyway, when Solange sings to her community, 
quote, this shit is for us. I think I know what she means. Her repeated line creates intimacy. It's affirming, a bounce back resilience. And it's intentional, I'm certain, to let those outside the community hear her sing it. Who is the message aimed at? Arrow plus horizon. Thank you. I'm sorry for going over time, but I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. It was tremendous. It was wonderful to see the visuals and to uh, hear and see your new work. So that was fabulous. So I want to thank you from everyone here. I can see by the expressions on people's faces that they were as happy as I am to um, hear you. I'm getting a message from Charles over here. Um, so I need to ask him to unmute. Uh, but I just, I want to reiterate how great it was. And I want to thank you for being here, Laylee. Oh, you're welcome. Thank <laughs> you for having me. <laughs> that was great. Can you also unmute Rachel, who has a pertinent and important announcement? Okay. I can ask, there you go. You're still muted, Rachel. Okay. Rachel, there, okay. Now you're I, unmuted. I asked for this unmuted mic, first to thank a reader, but also to offer a nationwide and international shout out of thanks to the inventors and curators of Enclave, that is to Jean, Ray, and to Charles and David for tech, Charles and David for tech support that really supports. This series has been striking, helpful, and pleasurable to all who've listened from poetry communities, from the wonderful handcrafted introductions to the serious attention demanded of listeners. I salute Charles, Ray, and Jean for the time, energy, and intelligence they have devoted to this enterprise and give heartfelt thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Rachel, much appreciated. And it's been a pleasure to us to do Enclave uh, because of wonderful readers and wonderful responses from the people that have come to our reading. So thank you all participants. Great to see many of you many times uh, during COVID, which has truly been a challenge. And also, um, particular thanks to Laylee, uh, given the difficulties in the adjacent Navajo reservation with COVID. So um, very sorrowful to hear of some of that. Charles, any words from you? This whole series has been a pleasure, but I also want to thank Laylee for just calling our attention to everything from those difficulties to those tumbleweeds. Thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs> thank you for having me. Thank you. Lovely to see you. Uh, lovely to see everyone. And as usual with Enclave, we say goodbye and close down. So see you um, with Charles and Tenny's Enclave in January, I hope. Bye. Bye. Bye.